Okay, very good morning, folks. Hope you're doing well. Wednesday, the 2nd of December. Uh, just going to give you a quick update, uh, recap of what happened yesterday. Positive close across the three major indices on Wall Street. Uh, why did that happen? A look at the key things to watch out for today. It certainly is a few things, uh, such as the ability for OPEC headlines still to influence the oil market today. Uh, Brexit, the euro is broken above a key level, continuation of dollar weakness. Uh, and so, yeah, a number of things I, I'd like to go through this morning. So, uh, Taking a quick look at how we finished first, and then we'll go through this in kind of chronological order. So the kind of combination of more positive progression on the vaccine side of things, uh, a couple of early signs of appetite perhaps picking up on Capitol Hill about another federal spending plan to come forward, which we'll dive into in a moment. Um, all of those things help sentiment in the Asia Pacific session. Remember, we had Chinese manufacturing activity index showing us uh, fastest acceleration in more than a decade. So a number of these things did did help. Um, but I, I guess one of the things I wanted to talk through which might help pull all of this together uh, is the kind of cross asset class movement. Yesterday we, we generally had stocks bid, gold bid, dollar weakness and uh, weakness in T-notes, so higher yields. Now I want to kind of focus on the yield story a little bit because I think that can kind of then um, be the catalyst then to explain some of why the other moves were happening. And it did throw a little bit of people by surprise because yesterday, um, if you remember, we had the latest uh, ISM manufacturing figure come out. It was a touch weaker than expected, but still heavily in expansionary territory. But the employment component was particularly weak. And people are looking at that. Obviously, employment data are very sensitive this week because we've got the National Employment Report payrolls on Friday. Uh, and expectations are for job growth, but deceleration as what we've been seeing in more kind of real-time data in the likes of the weekly jobless claims, which have been rising. Uh, that idea then that that forces the Fed, uh, in a sense, to then have this lower for longer mantra. And that is one of the underlying reasons of the continuation of dollar weakness. So currency markets liked it in terms of euro dollar cable. There was some other headline news flow for sterling late in the afternoon, of course, that blipped it up. Um, but that also showed an initial positive reaction in stocks. However, yields rised and yields actually really saw a decent move to the upside. And, and I wanted to talk through this because the reason behind it, but also then what does it mean for other asset classes? And this is the kind of headline on Bloomberg and a few pieces to walk you through. So here, Treasury yield spike risks sparking a domino effect. And here then is what I'm, what I'm kind of talking about. And the reason for this is because the benchmark 10-year yields jumped back toward 1% yesterday. And if I just look at the 10-year yield, this is what it kind of looks like if you're looking in, in yield terms rather than price, if you're looking at the T-note. And we're coming back up to where we were earlier um, in the aftermath of, I guess, the initial election kind of volatility and back to the highs and where we were trading in the early part of summer. But 1%, really, we haven't been above that level since uh, kind of the pre-pandemic or around, I guess, the volatility of the initial pandemic here back in March. Um, so a couple of different things. Stocks. You know, why then uh, would the yield be important for stocks? Well, I've highlighted a couple of segments here from a Bloomberg article that I really think, uh, I guess, it's much easier to then simplify the reasoning or rationale. And here, one of the clearest winners from a modest rise in treasury yields could actually be equities. Now, some people uh, often think then that there's kind of this inverse classical relationship um, where there's kind of rotation on risk of into one and out of another and vice versa. And that actually, um, if uh, yields are rising, well, then that should mean as a net consequence, probably tightening of rates and therefore bad for equities. But I'd say you've got to think about the stepstone approach to get to that point. I mean, we're a million miles away from rates rising in the US, multiple years, and that's even been pushed out further as far as investors' psyche is concerned by the likes of Janet Yellen coming in as the nominee for the Treasury Secretary, for example. So here then, what we're kind of saying is that one of the clearest winners for a modest rise in Treasury yields could actually be equities because rates aren't gonna change anytime soon. And this would be then tied, the yield movement, to the perception then that uh, of a reflating economy. That being then that as a signal that economic recovery is going to take hold. 
And as we said, we've had a lot of positive developments on how quickly the approval process is happening with some of these latest COVID-19 vaccines. So the MSCI World Index is already trading at a record uh, and the rotation to cyclical shares such as industrial and metals or materials names very much so accelerated last month. And that would be tied then to that economic recovery kind of narrative in that sense. And they were the stocks obviously that were beaten down uh, and were hard hit during the initial onset of the actual pandemic. So that's stocks. The other thing here then is looking at, at gold and how might that react in this way? Um, because as you know then, if the normal sequence of events, if it's higher yields and it's tied to then rate thinking as policy, it's gonna tighten, well, typically that should strengthen the dollar and net result then inverse reaction would be weakening gold. But actually, um, again we've got to get to that point if rates are going to remain low well then one of the things here is the treasury yield rising to one percent or even higher back to where we were initially kind of let's say pre-pandemic is due to a reflation trade then inflation break-evens gold and gold miners and commodities usually do well you know if there's going to be future inflation in the future of which if there's all this pent-up kind of stimulus in the system there's more perhaps coming in the, in the US and we're gonna have a very loose accommodative monetary policy, well then inflation demand as the economy grows will definitely pick up and therefore as a inflation kind of hedge, uh, that could be very good for gold and associated commodities and gold miners on again, uh, that, that recovery story and hedge play. The other thing then is looking at the currency market. Uh, and kind of making sense of some of this dollar movement and we already know then that that lower for longer rate mentality is is obviously negative for for the us dollar but should the us yield curve steepen as inflation expectations rise as we've just discussed this will incentivize investors to currency hedge so citigroup strategists were talking in a recent note and they said moves by investors to shield from currency fluctuations in us investments could see the dollar fall as much as 20 percent next year. I mean, that's a pretty bold call, but I think just worth noting then in terms of the, the prospect for the dollar and why a lot of these big funds are very bearish on uh, the greenback at the moment. Goldman Sachs Asset Management, who see the potential for more curve steepening, so i.e. higher rates longer out, is forecasting a weaker dong dollar against emerging market currencies such as the Chinese yuan. Um, and I think, yeah, there's a couple of good graphics here. Uh, I did share this on the Amplify Twitter if you wanted to have a look, but hopefully that makes a little bit more sense of the world and why some of these movements are, are happening at, at the moment. Because I think a few people were scratching their heads as to the yield move um, that wasn't quite fitting with the overall other asset class movement, but hopefully that makes more sense of why. And I think that yield move was definitely more tied to a lot of this conversation, which is talking about the prospect of more spending in the US. And so let me run you through, I guess, what you need to know in terms of where we're at with this. So US Congress should include a fresh wave of coronavirus stimulus in a must pass $1.4 trillion spending bill aimed at heading off a government shutdown in the midst of the pandemic. That was according to the top Senate Republican Mitch McConnell yesterday. President-elect Joe Biden separately spoke of passing a coronavirus aid bill quickly and debating an additional bill early next year. And Congress needs to rush all of this through basically in the next nine days. So by December the 11th, and the reason for that is they need to keep government agencies funded because without action and a compromise, at least at this point, a, a range of government programs will be interrupted and many federal workers will be furloughed, uh, which they'll definitely want to avoid just given the economic situation of this pandemic uh, period. Uh, separately, one of the other things we heard yesterday was a bipartisan group of senators and House members have proposed a $908 billion um, amount in a range of COVID-19 relief measures. Um, so nothing really concrete here, but if you remember, the kind of stimulus talk went absolutely silent after there was a lot of it going into the election because there was a lot of political posturing by both parties trying to kind of show their will to help the common man in America. But uh, we kind of knew, though, that Pelosi and Mnuchin were never going to cut a deal uh, at the risk of giving the others a victory, the other side, ahead of the election. So as soon as that election played out, as it has done, the whole talks have just ceased. Uh, and although there hasn't been too much of a negative invert or 
negative impact in markets. The longer that goes on, probably the longer there potentially could be. So overall then, what this has meant is that this talk yesterday definitely has been a uh, kind of uh, a positive step forward, progressive nature of then the idea that there could be another spending bill coming in the US. And, and obviously that then has having implications on um, both yields, but also helps with this equity story. And hence the reason why the NASDAQ and the S&P were back up at those record high levels yesterday. Uh, you'd have to excuse the jingles. It's not, uh, uh, it's not quite Christmas yet. My, my cat's having his uh, morning exercise. But um, just having a look then at some other, other headline stories that I wanted to update you on. One is that equity index futures have drifted a little bit off the highs during the Asia Pacific session. Now, I don't think that's too unusual given a day of rises like we had yesterday. The market does tend to go in an ebb and flow. We get a push, a bit of a pullback directionally, though, like the dollar's weakening. Equities generally are trending higher. Um, one thing to be aware of, though, is the New York Times piece. Uh, this was talking about um, what we kind of touched upon yesterday in the FT at the weekend, which is this idea that perhaps China actually might have preferred uh, Trump getting a second term rather than Joe Biden. And this latest article really kind of sums that up to a certain degree because um, overnight in the Asia Pacific session, the offshore yuan erased again after a report that President uh, elect Joe Biden won't immediately remove tariffs on Chinese goods uh, and plans to review phase one trade pact with China and consult with allies in Asia and Europe. Again, I think it's a bit of a misconception. People kind of make the assumption that um, if it's not Trump, then there's then there's no problem with China and there will be no tariffs. I think that is inappropriate uh, in that kind of assumption. Uh, definitely, Biden has the same kind of interests of America first type mentality. It's just expressed in a different and more unified response with the developed Western world. And that is what causes slight more geographic tension there with China and on the geopolitical relationship. And hence the reason why we saw a little bit of overnight movement in the offshore yuan. Uh, because of this nature that, that tariffs are not going to be rolled back uh, just because Biden's come in. Um, and, and we're going to have to wait the response to see really the details of how this plays out over the coming months. But certainly the risk factor, if you like, of not really knowing what's going to come next from Trump has been removed. And that generally will help calm and stability on the situation. One would think more rational minds would kind of uh, win out in the end. The other thing then was Brexit, and we had obviously that big late pop in the pound. And <laughs> I can see uh, as soon as I've started delivering this briefing, uh, headlines obviously come out because look, the pound's just blasted lower. Look, even as I'm talking, if I stick this on a minute, look, this is literally just happening right now. Um, so you, whenever there's a fundamental piece of news, when you look at charts for long enough, you can kind of get used to price pattern movement. And if there's a fundamental development, then it moves markets immediately. There's no building up of price and trending. If it's an important piece of news, it moves the price. And the price of sterling was susceptible to this today. Uh, and this is, you know, welcome to the land of Brexit headlines. Uh, this is what it's all about, really. Uh, and I think this is why you've got to be very agile and adaptable to conditions. We know how negotiations go, right? Um, it's, it's signs of progression, roll back. Signs of progression, roll back. Posture, I'm going to leave the talks, then I come back. So we go from extremities of really positive to really negative. And this really explains this trend we've been in for the best part of a week for cable, which is up and down, up and down. And, uh, you know, don't get chopped up in that noise. Uh, and just, just look to take the broader outer range of that market and then play accordingly. And, and certainly, you know, one of the guys got a really nice trade off the lower of the range and held it all the way up and then uh, into the top of that end of the range. And, uh, you know, just good patience of just playing that, that, that standard range. But then late yesterday, we had the headline break and basically it was indicating that um, it was Tom Newton done. Uh, the former Sun political editor now of the Times Radio came out and he was talking about they're moving into more focused tunnel talks. We broke the range, the headline came, the catalyst was the tweet, uh, and then we snapped higher. Came quite late, generally then uh, tends to exacerbate the price movement. It was around 4.10, I think, when it happened, that sort of time, um, and we blasted higher. 
But we've just blipped lower, as I said. So the latest here I can see, EU Chief Negotiator Barnier has told EU envoys that differences remain on the three key sticking points, trade talks with the UK, a deal still hangs in the balance. So if you, uh, you, know, if you just step back for a moment and take a, a bird's eye view of what's happening, the same three sticking points. So nothing's happened. Um, one would suggest that there's no you know, smoke without fire and they're kind of, I guess, the frequency of the idea of them cutting a deal has come from both the UK and the European side of it happening as so soon as this week. Regardless of that political outcome, I think the best way to think about this is market positioning. What I mean by this is that the pound was high. I mean, it's moved up through the top end of that range with that dollar weakness obviously also helping. But the idea being then is the market is progressively pricing in a deal. And so anything that would detract from that point is going to be met negatively. So rather than try to be this political soothsayer, um, as much as we can express that, and you know, still my view is I don't think they're going to get a deal done, as I've always said, until a little bit later on in this month when those real hard deadlines start to emerge. But that aside, just think about, well, if the pound is very high and it's based on optimism of a deal happening, well, then ultimately there's more risk to a larger move to the downside than relief rally to the upside. And that's the best way to approach it. Just having a look here at the pound, I mean, Technically, I was kind of lining up these charts to have a bit of a talk, and uh, I guess this, this latest Barnier comment has, has kind of done that job. But on the upside, there is obviously that early September high that we had on the 1st, which is definitely worth keeping an eye on should we resume the upward trend at 134.83, looking at the futures here. The reason why that level is really important is if I put, on, if I put sterling on a weekly chart, um, this starts to incorporate now, um, this is the... EU referendum right here on the left hand side. So I've just got a broad uh, fib retracement of the entire high to low of the referendum price activity, uh, just to give me an overall bigger remit of what I'm looking at. And you can see why that September level is quite key. That's this one here that we were just looking at on the daily chart. This is now looking on a weekly. So these levels here go all the way back. And th this is a, such a key area here around 134. 83 if I'm looking on the weeklies here and we're not that far off here uh, at the moment within a point um, I mean that's even taking into the Barnier move so we're even closer before that came out so really quite key uh, any break above here you've got the 618 retracement of that entire sell-off which would be just above and that would start coming in uh, around the 136 and a half type level the bigger level then target wise would be 140 but in order to get up here um, I, on the balance, I think that we will actually in the coming months because uh, the dollar, if it does continue this weakening trend of all the things we've just spoken about in combination then with actually a, uh, a trade deal secured uh, through the uh, negotiations as we go into the new year, well, then that actually could be quite optimal then for a technical break above these key levels and then a, a move back up to 140. Uh, so yeah, but that's more definitely more medium term rather than an intraday at this point. So for now, we're back in that that kind of cluster of price movements. So although we're drifting south here in, in the pound, I definitely probably wouldn't be interested unless it comes back down to the lower bound of uh, probably these areas here firstly, uh, which was the last two days lows. And if not, then below a little bit lower to the low on the 24th and late on the 27th down there. Yeah, but a, a good, uh, hopefully, exercise of just explaining the, the news cycle and how to react to those types of headlines. The one thing is with Brexit, you know, I'd say you've got to be quite proactive with managing any trade, really, if it's tied to a, a kind of a sensitivity of a political development. And the reason for that is central bankers, very rarely do they flip flop and change their tone and what they're saying. Politicians do it like the change of wind. It's just how they roll. So... With that being said, then, you're always at risk of a lot of headline noise, particularly then that intensifies as we get in towards key deadlines. But again, use that market positioning as your guide. While we're on currencies, absolutely a key one to keep an eye on is going to be the euro. Now, the euro saw a really big breakout of a really important level, of course, which is this one 
20 level. Now, this is the move that, that happened yesterday, late afternoon. Uh, kind of coincided as well with when that sterling breakout happened, just kind of weighed on the, the dollar even more at the time. And we have printed up very close to 121 now in the futures. So we're kind of locked in a little bit of a short term uh, range as the market kind of decides then what's the next move here. Um, if we start to break down in price, probably be just using some of this price movement then uh, as flaws then to manage the position on the retracement back down. But a key thing here is why is 120 so important? Well, this is looking now on a, a daily continuation. And I'm on this chart here, you can see price activity from on the left hand side here around July through to the current day. It was back at the beginning of September on the 1st when ECB's chief economist Philip Lane came out and said euro dollar rate does matter. This was that voicing of concern about the strength of the euro which we were talking about yesterday. And then the move that came after that was pretty strong which was you know kind of tantamount to ECB intervention to offset then what had been a euro currency. Remember the context of the time within the prior seven weeks, eight weeks of that statement from Philip Lane, the euro dollar pair had gone from 113 to 120. So the ECB probably felt pretty compelled to come in and go, well, we need to stop in, we need to stop this freight train. Otherwise this is gonna really impede the European economic recovery. So they did. Now yesterday, well, the previous day, I should say Monday, we got up to 120. You remember what happened? Big rejection. And we came all the way back down to that range high of the highs that were seen in SEP and uh, early November. And then yesterday, though, smashed through there with a combination of those different themes which we've been talking about coming through. So it shot high and a big breakout on confirmation of that break. So the interesting thing is today, and let me just triple check the time, Philip Lane, the same guy that made the comment here, is talking today at 2 p.m. London time. Now, Lagarde was talking yesterday, but she spoke prior to this breakout in Euro strength that we saw. And so I'm particularly interested to see if he comments on the Euro, regardless of the subject matter of his, his topic and speech um, and what he's talking on. So something to definitely keep an eye out for. If they start jawboning the currency, which is effectively trying to talk about perhaps economic risks or the fact that they're going to do more in terms of the PEP or stimulus or, or monetary policy being looser, all of this, an attempt to try and slow down the runaway strength of the euro. Because if we look on the weekly, um, there's a couple of interesting things to look at here on the weekly chart. I mean, the last time we were up really uh, firmly above 120, which was back in 2018. This is 2018 era here. And this is a key area really of 121, which was that high. This is actually the high of the summer of 2017 here. We can see as resistance for a period at the beginning of Jan 2018 before the break higher that came uh, at the week after the new year period of that year. Uh, and then it was a support point before the break back down below that point. So that area we are within touching distance of already as of this morning. So that's quite key to watch. Big area of resistance as the next one beyond this 120 breach that we've seen on the higher time frame. Any move beyond that point probably would start looking up to around the April 18 highs. So we start pretty much going in point increments now. So that is around 121.80 type level. And then to the bottom end of that kind of range, 122 and a half. Um, and then really the 2018 high, we'd have to get much higher up. But one would imagine that if we start getting a one over 125 and a half toward 125 in itself up here. I mean, the ECB will really, I think, ramp up then um, some of the talk to try and uh, verbally intervene and manage that uh, price appreciation. But there is risks there for the ECB, given, of course, that overall market positioning is fairly bearish um, at the moment for the US dollar. So that as well with, don't forget, a, a divergence at the moment of COVID situation where typically COVID is at a slightly more advanced stage of plateauing in some countries in mainland Europe and even in the UK as restrictions loosen as of today back into the uh, national to more localised state tier or uh, tiered levels comparative to still a pretty bad situation that's unfolding in the US. Um, on the point of vaccines, 
Uh, the latest there for timing uh, is that the first shipment of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine will be delivered on December 15th, and the first shipment of Moderna's vaccine will be delivered on December 22nd, contingent upon decision by the FDA, which will review those um, particular vaccines on December 10th and December 17th, respectively, according to the Operation Warp Speed document that was circulated yesterday. All right, final things, because I know I've been talking for a while, but hopefully this has all been a useful exercise. Um, just going to have a look at the API numbers from last night. Um, we had a build of 4.146 million. This was uh, surprising against analyst expectations of a draw of 1.7. Uh, gasoline also a fairly sizable build of, of 3.4, but Cushing a draw, just over 100,000. Um, although those numbers definitely fit this kind of uh, recent price movement of oil trading a touch heavy, you know, there is a bigger story in town at the moment, which is the OPEC situation. Uh, we obviously have already known from the day before about the delay in talks while they'll look to try and kind of manage the situation in order to get a deal done. Uh, I still think they'll get a deal done and they will roll over as the base case view in regards to securing them uh, the current existing pack through Q1. However, uh, it's not done until the fat lady sings. And so until that point, I think you've got to be aware of the fact that they could still be breaking headlines, rumors, and so on. So I'll keep you informed, obviously, in the Amplify live room, myself and Tim, um, but worth keeping that on Twitter as well. Um, there's a couple of things. The latest last night from one of the main talking heads was that an, um, there's a lot of hope building towards reaching agreement to roll over the current cuts for three months. The consultations between OPEC and non-OPEC members will continue as of today. It's not really giving away too much uh, at the moment. Again, got to think about kind of uh, scenario building. Uh, the bigger risk here, given that if I just zoom out of this chart, just even slightly to incorporate the month of November, oil obviously has seen a really strong move from the high 38s up to the high 40s in price. So the risk is to the downside. And if they decide and cannot get enough um, cohesion amongst the OPEC plus alliance to get this rollover in place, well, then this price is susceptible to a fairly dramatic pullback in price. But again, I would say that that is low probability outcome uh, of those discussions. That meaning not till tomorrow. That doesn't mean that we might not get more comments and movement there um, today. Okay, rounding up, a quick look at the calendar. What have we got? Um, just having a quick look here. You've already had um, a few things this morning. You've got European unemployment rate. Uh, I don't see that really as a market move or consideration. I think at the moment, the market's more looking technically at the euro given uh, the lofty levels we trade, given the accelerated price yesterday. And as I said, Chief Economist Philip Lane speaking at 2 p.m. will be a key one there, I think. In the interim period, look for dollar movement though. We do have ADP national employment, 115. Um, we've then got the oil inventory data to follow up from the DOE at 3.30. Um, and then speaker wise, it's all based in the afternoon. Uh, a couple of Fed speakers to accompany Lane from the ECB. And you've also got Bank of England's Haskell um, is speaking at 6 p.m. London time at the University of Bristol. Um, so that is it, guys. Um, let you get on with the day. I'll see those. Um, on the live stream in Amplify Live. If you'd like to join us there, remember, check out the link below if you're watching this video on YouTube. Otherwise, stay safe, have a good day. See you same time tomorrow. Thanks very much.